Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. I'm Jim Fleisick here for segment three of our show, Profiles in Excellence, coming to you from the National Press Club. With me in the final segment are two uh, key leaders in the Department of Homeland Security, Soraya Correa, who is the Chief Procurement Officer, and Luke McCormick, who is the Chief Information Officer. We're talking about uh, profiles and excellent. We're talking about successful programs, programs you're running that you're proud of. Luke, let's start with you. Tell us uh, about a, a particular program you're proud of that's uh, making some progress. Thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, let me uh, uh, talk about a, um, it's actually a sort of a constellation of programs, uh, five pilots that we're doing. We, we feel this is very important because it really is focused on the what we like to call the tip of the spear, uh, where we're enabling the mission. In this case, these are uh, uh, business applications uh, that are across our components uh, at various stages of their life cycle. And we are taking all of these applications and all these um, uh, solutions and um, piloting a, uh, a concept um, where we're decomposing them, reconstructing them, shrinking how we deliver them, and, uh, and making sure that we get functionality out to the mission operator. What do I mean by that? This is everything from uh, you know, the, uh, the time to market in respect to alternatives of analysis. We okay. need to understand what it is we're trying to do as far as what the business is. So you're trying to shrink is. every aspect of the life cycle. Every aspect of the, uh, of the acquisition life cycle. So not just the procurement, right? We'll talk about in the, in that, that in a minute, the creativity there. But really, what is it what we're trying to do? Are we trying to build something? Are we trying to buy something? Are we trying to uh, cross service with something? Uh, used to take us up to a year to do that alternative analysis. We shrunk that down to uh, weeks and months, uh, which has also shrunk down the, uh, the cost of that. Uh, from there, we decide if this is a purpose-built system, uh, which we would go in in sort of an agile mode, or if it's a COT system, which we've done in some cases, or if we're going to cross-service with a line of business or an agency that's already doing this. Um, now, this, does your flash program I'm reading about, does that fit into this model or is that something different? It does. So when we get into a situation where it's purpose-built, uh, which we, uh, we tend to find ourselves doing that uh, um, as often as uh, um, probably at least 50 percent of the solutions, uh, we're using an agile methodology to do that. When we started piloting these concepts, we recognized that we needed more uh, capacity, more service in that area. So we reached over to Shariah's shop and said, hey, listen, uh, we have some capability now. We need more of that. Uh, let's talk about a, uh, maybe a creative way to go after that, do that in a short amount of time, get that capacity available so that when we decide we need to deliver a purpose-built business system, which again is at least 50% of our environment at this point, probably more, uh, we need to do that very quickly, get access to those services very quickly. So I'll throw it over to Shariah because we went through a very creative way about how to actually acquire the agile services that we then use to build these business purpose. Okay, we'll go to systems. Soraya, then I wanna come back to you and talk about some of the other benefits you're seeing come out of these programs, maybe some challenges, maybe some lessons learned that mm -hmm. you can pass on to others that are trying to, to do the same kind of things you're doing. Soraya, how are you? Oh, wonderful. Thanks for being here. Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, <clears throat> let's talk about some of the pro, I've been reading a lot about the ways you're streamlining procurement at DHS. Tell us about some of the things you're doing sure. and you're, you're proud of. Sure, well, thank you. Well, since I uh, took this position Position, one of the things that I've tried to focus on is bringing some innovation, some creativity to our contracting processes. Um, I've, I've been in this business for a long time and I always hear people say, you can't do this, you can't right. do that, and that's not really true. The FAR actually is a pretty flexible document. You just have to understand it and know how to use it. So mm -hmm. one of the things I've done there is- There are no constraints, just challenges. Just challenges, there you go. So operating within the four corners of the FAR, I stood up what's called a Procurement Innovation Lab, and basically that's a virtual lab that gives an opportunity for contracting officers, program managers to bring us ideas on how we can streamline or enhance or improve our business processes, whether it's ev how we uh, handle a particular evaluation factor, how we evaluate proposals, or a business process such as closeouts. So to, to dovetail into uh, Luke's discussion about Flash, one of the things that I've, I've tried to focus on and make sure my folks understand is that it is imperative to really understand the needs of our customers. And in the CIO community, what we did was we actually brought together several representatives from this, the different CIOs at DHS, including Luke's office, and we actually whiteboarded the idea of a Flash contract. Okay. 
And what that really means is I started with the question, how are you going to use this vehicle? Right. What are you going to use it for? How are you going to order services? And we started basically with the end Focus result that you're looking for. Focus on the result. For. Exactly. And then let's figure out how to yeah. achieve and the then, result rather than the, the processes exactly. you need to go Don't through. Don't tell me how to write it. Tell me what you're trying to do, and I'll see if I can come up with a good answer. So we sat around, and we, we and literally, it was in a roundtable discussion. We talked through the high-level 50,000-foot strategy, then turned it over to our teams to make it happen. We ran it through the Procurement Innovation Lab so that we can adopt some of these innovations mm -hmm. that we've been working on. And one of the exciting aspects of Flash was we did everything totally different. We had an industry day that was completely different from any other industry day okay. because it was not focused on the solicitation or regurgitating back to the audience about the solicitation. We actually talked about the kinds of programs that are under the pilots that we're going to use this vehicle for. We had subject matter experts available to talk to industry reps. We did a little speed dating for industry okay. so they could team up. And then we answered questions, any questions that they had, including a little speed dating with government reps to answer questions. When we issued our solicitation, what really surprised the industry was we had a tech challenge. Okay. Instead of the standard, you know, write me a tech proposal of 100 pages right. or whatever, it was really a tech challenge where we describe a problem and they're going to come in and present the solution using the methodology, their agile methodology. And we had teams of observers as well as evaluators that worked with these companies. And the companies had four to six hours to present their technical challenge, a one hour presentation, and then they get to go away. Wow. Staffing proposal was less than 10 pages, past performance. Did industry from, like this, do you think? So was far, the feedback, the feedback has been positive from industry, Because yes. it moved faster. It moved faster. It got them through the process faster. Um, it might not have gotten them the answer they wanted. We're finding that out, right? Right, but, well. <laughs> but we did in 120 days what normally would have taken two years, because this is, Flash is a strategically sourced vehicle. Right. We received 114 proposals. Another thing that we did unusual was that we did publicize how many proposals we got, not from whom. Um, we kept industry informed of the status of the procurement. So every month we were issuing an announcement. And we just recently announced awards. Unfortunately, we got a protest. Not surprised, right? right? That happens. But it was a 100% small business set aside. We said we would award somewhere between 8 to 15 contracts, mm -hmm. which we did. Um, so we pretty much followed through on yeah, everything we excellent. said we would do. But the, the, the idea behind this was let's simplify the process and make sure that you have the ability to get what you're really looking for. And one of the questions that I consistently ask Luke and the, and the other CIOs is, how are you going to know? What do you need to see from a vendor? What right. do you want them to do? What kind of people do they bring to the table that gives you an assurance that this is the right pick right. over another? Right. And I don't think that's in a written proposal. Well, I'll tell you, too, an idea of communicating through the process. I mean, what a, what a, what a novel idea. Let's mm -hmm. communicate. Uh, but I've seen, you know, since leaving government and the government, you know, from the time something starts, the communications go down, 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 down. Whereas in industry, from the time something starts, communication actually goes up to get to an award phase so that when you get there, there's less likelihood of a protest because everyone's been aware of the process throughout the entire thing. Luke, what's some of the challenges you saw with this methodology? Well, let me just cap onto a couple things there. So um, finish out that story. So uh, um, very unconventional way of doing that, uh, a mixture of traditional, non-traditional vendors that we brought in uh, on board. Um, uh, in, into that environment. I'm real proud of the fact that we recognized early on as we were doing those alternative of analysis, again, in a very short amount of time, uh, that we are going to do purpose-built. We don't have the capacity. Uh, rather than sort of say, all right, we're just going to kind of go through the traditional method because that's what we know, we said, no, we need this capability. 120 days later, very unconventional way of doing things, very innovative. We'll have that capability on board. Did the same thing with a cloud vendor because we knew we needed that capability as well. And then we're off and running. And so the, the intent there is to design purpose-built, very specific systems to meet those business needs. You know, there's only one TSA in the world, right? There's only one citizen and immigration services in the world. They need very specific sure. systems to meet their specific needs. Using this type of um, capability and these methodologies, you can deliver uh, minimal viable products get early feedback and continue to do that. That's a tectonic shift in the way we used to deliver software services. Sure. Uh, the challenge is there is, of course, that's a lot of moving parts, right? And so we always have to balance this, and, and Soraya and I have had several discussions with our leadership team about, you know, how far do we push that to you to the point where you get what I call sort of anti-aerobic, you know, you right. can almost do too much 
activity where you just not, it's not being absorbed, yeah. right? You gotta stay um, focused. Right, and there's a lot of demands, as you can imagine, on just like any agency has a lot of demands on them to deliver these types of capabilities to meet the mission needs. And, uh, you know, you have folks that, uh, you know, under a lot of pressure might want to slip back to kind of what they know, even sure. though the gains are really in these areas that, yes, you have to experiment, yes, you have to push the envelope, yes, we are getting into the unknown, that's where the leadership comes in. We talk about, you know, we've got to take on some risk to lower our risk, right, and we've got to reward that. We know that these folks are going to make some mistakes. We've got to be able to give them the air cover there and be able to adjust accordingly. And it, 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 we're not going to get it all clean and straight down the middle every time we do it. We're not following the policies. We went out and talked to our oversight folks, GAO, OMB, The Hill, and we told them, hey, listen, if you come in here and you look at how our policies are written about how we deliver solutions and you look at what we're doing over here, they are not going to be the same, yeah. right, because we're learning how to do this. But we're not going to go write a policy and then hope we, we get it right. We're going to learn from these pilots and then we're going to, Write right. the policy. Excellent. Excellent. So you know you're really getting into some gray area. Those challenges are just you know uh, working with the uh, the community and making sure that they can absorb it. They're comfortable with the level of risk that we're taking, and that we you know do the proper oversight as we learn right. how to do this right. well and responsibly. Well, you got to challenge people to you know um, to to actually take some risks and you know, move forward. And uh, I remember once uh, I was in government, I actually proposed giving an award out to somebody who tried to do something different, take a risk, and didn't achieve it. But um, somebody at the political level didn't think that was a real good idea. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, <coughs> Soraya, same. I could add something to what you sure, was saying. I'm going to ask you the, the same question. The communications piece is really critical here. How we communicated with our teams, but also how we were communicating with industry and keeping everyone engaged in the process, as well as redefining the priorities as we went along. In other words, you do need people to focus. And people can get a little overwhelmed and jump to very different topics, all, you know, start jumping into other areas. And what we tried to do was keep everyone together and make sure that, look, let's work one thing at a time here. We can't do everything at once. We can't boil the ocean at once. Yeah, great points. Uh, Adrian Gardner, the CIO from FEMA, has just joined us. Welcome, Adrian. Uh, thanks for uh, getting down here through your busy schedule. But um, we're talking here about profiles and excellence. We're talking about, um, you know, things that uh, you're proud of that, uh, can you tell us about FEMA maybe, a program that uh, you would like to highlight that you have seen real progress over the last uh, year or so? Yeah, I'm sure that uh, probably Luke and Soraya have already uh, discussed the flash contract and, they did. and they did. FEMA was actually pivotal in, in sort of teaming with the department on, Man, on getting I that I think we ought to have like patriotic music playing behind you folks, you know, about we, we, uh, all this should. working together stuff, you know? Yeah, we should. And as, and as Luke, I'm sure, has mentioned, you know, the, the largest agile contract that will probably be led across the government as, as a whole. Um, and so that's very much one of the things that we're looking to leverage uh, across a number of our modernization activities. So very proud of sort of that partnership. I would say the other thing sort of working in concert with the CIO Council, very much on uh, governance and sort of the discussions on how do we strategically look at acquisitions. FEMA is looking to put out um, also some, some uh, different acquisitions and we've been teaming right. very well with Luke and Sarai on sort of looking at how we advance that thought and strategically aligning it behind the department. So yeah, actually, you know, governance, I think, too, based on everything you're saying, Luke and Soraya and now Adrian, you know, when you're looking at uh, changed ways of doing things, to have a governance process in place so that everybody can, you know, rally and get on the same page has to be a major priority. Right. And I think the other thing I would speak to is the Agile IPT. So we've been working along with uh, Luke and Soraya and their shop on how do we bring Agile to the modernization activities we have and make sure that the, the chief technology officer is integrated into that uh, discussion at the at the component level. And so very much great uh, dialogue on streamlining the software engineering lifecycle process and ensuring that there's complete engagement with the XO community at the department as as partners as we get run this paperwork through to ensure that that uh, the U.S., the deputy USM and others can make an informed decision as far as the integrity of a project. Sure, excellent. Um, Soraya, back to those challenges. Um, since you're talking about new ways to do things, working with your team who someone brought up the fact they're used to doing way, things certain ways, was that a major challenge for you to change that culture around? It is a major challenge because we're still in the process of doing it. But here's the thing. People are willing to step up and take chances when they know that they're going to be supported, that they know that 
you're going to let them fail if, if they're going to fail, hopefully they're not, or you're going to help them course correct. But top cover is really important. Absolutely. And, and in my business, especially the, the procurement business, we have a culture of risk aversion. We have a culture of fear. Um, the common statement that I always hear is we could get a protest. I tell people you're going to get a protest. Don't worry about that. Let's focus on writing a procurement that where we can win the protest because right. that's what the goal. And you know what? If we don't win the protest, that's okay. We'll course correct. I would prefer to win, but you know what? I'm willing to take a few chances to innovate, to be creative, and to ultimately do what I came to do, which is to deliver on the mission. All three of us, what we are focused on is making sure that we put out these successful programs because each of the programs that we're working are about the mission of this agency. It is about improving the capability of this agency to deliver on its vital mission. So we're going to take some chances. Is, it, is everybody in the procurement community at DHS engaged? Not 100%, but I'm out there talking to right. them on a regular and basis. And you persevere, and like we heard from the exactly. other Exactly. Same thing with the communication with industry. As mm -hmm. you mentioned, to have the tendency in the government is to drop the level of communication when we put out an RFP. I'm trying to challenge people to raise that level of communication. Keep industry informed. Put out announcements on the schedule and what's changed or, or you know, if you're going to be delayed, just tell them you're going to be delayed. But let's keep that dialogue going and let's not be fearful of telling people where we are and what we're doing. Talking to the GAO and IG, a lot of people think that's unheard of, that we would go and take a process to the GAO and IG and say we're doing that. I did it with my quick closeout right. procedures. I said, here, I'm going to try this. Oh, what do you think? A lot, lot better to do it up front rather than exactly. you, uh, I told you so or I got you so down the road, you know, where uh, all of yeah. a sudden you, you get the surprise. And I do want to emphasize that what we're really talking about is good planning, smart planning, where you sit around a table and you say, what are we trying to do? Right. And how do we get there? Right. And we lay out a nice road map. And then we course correct as we go. And right. we've done that quite a few times. Well, what I really like is the fact that you're looking at focusing on the result. You know, mm -hmm. let's let's look at the result we're trying to achieve here. Let's talk about some of the lessons you're learning along the way here as you go through these processes. Let's start with Adrian. Adrian, what are some of the uh, lessons you're learning along the way as you go through these programs and these new new ways of doing things? Yeah, I, I think it's communicate, communicate, communicate. I mean, you know, a lot of times we're like we're heads down. Um, not really looking at all times at the strategic value of that communications. And so I think, again, like the Agile IPT, that's really a communication method right. that we've brought into play as far as how we're going to deal with some of FEMA's modernization activities. And I think that's happening across the, several of the other components as well. So I'd say communication is, is key to it. Communicate, communicate. Correct. I think the other thing is then looking at the governance model where we have to good, have project, good project and program governance. So we've been placing that within FEMA. We have several executive steering committees over, that oversee these modernization activities. Um, all three of them, which is the grants, moder grants management modernization, the financial system modernization, and also the flood insurance program are all financial systems or mixed financial systems. Absolutely. And so what we've done is we've created one executive steering committee that actually oversees um, all three of those activities and then can report up agilely to the department. Excellent, excellent. We're down to our last minute or so here. Luke, uh, you, uh, lesson learned you'd like to throw out there real quick? Yeah, I, I would say that... Um, uh, well, we, 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 we understood that we were going to get in a situation where as we started to experience challenges maybe with some other projects that weren't part of the pilots, uh, we told ourselves we, we, we needed to stabilize those but not make them pilot number six, seven, and eight because uh, at some point you just have to stay focused, right, because there is some uh, cultural barriers and just some, some you know, just some uh, uh, communication barriers and things that you have to work through. And that takes energy, that takes time sure. on the leadership. And so uh, a lesson learned there is to, to stay diligent about that and, and not, you know, broaden yourself out and stay focused on, uh, you know, achieving what you set out to achieve. And um, uh, while we want to remain flexible, we have to stay focused as well so that Excellent. we can, you Excellent. know, get to the, uh, the end game. Uh, Sarai, you have the last word here. The We're done thing, our last minute. So the only thing I would add, they both hit on the two topics that I would say, the leadership and the communication, the regular communication, but also make no assumptions. Ask the question. Don't assume that you understand. Go in the room, ask the questions, no matter how dumb you think that question is, because you're going to find out that you're going to learn something. New. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. I want to thank our panelists for taking time from their busy schedules to be with us today. I want to thank our sponsors that help us put this program on, without which we don't have a program. Uh, I want to thank the good people here at National National Press Club for uh, accommodating us today, the good people at Federal News Radio who, uh, who accommodate us each month and uh, help us produce the show, and most importantly, 
our listening audience that tune in and listen to the show. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM.